Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you joined and listened in to this webinar today. I would like to say good afternoon to everyone uh, joining from Africa and Europe and uh, good morning for people who are based in the United States. Um, Today, uh, we, uh, this webinar is organized in uh, anticipation of Unlocking Solar Capital Africa conference uh, that will take place at the 25th and 26th of October in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. The title of today's webinar is Africa's Solar Challenge, Linking Finance to Untapped Solar Potential. So we are very happy to have two excellent speakers today and I will introduce them in a moment. I am Lydia van Os, I'm project manager of Solar Plaza's emerging market and finance team. Um, the topics that we are discussing today are an in-depth discussion on current finance solutions for Africa's solar projects and exploring options to accelerate the current slow pace of on-grid development in Africa. Um, and even more, we will discuss some innovating finance instruments and business models that align with market demand. Um, the speakers of today are Charlotte Aubert Kalajan. She is founder and CEO of Greenwish Partners. And we have Usainu Nakolima, who is the director of renewable energy and energy efficiency at the African Development Bank. Um, we will have two, two uh, short presentations today that is followed by a discussion. Um, and we have a Q&A session after that. Um, about Solar Plaza. Um, so the aim of Solar Plaza is empowering professional in, professionals in solar business development by building the most variable solar network. event. Uh, so we hope that Abidjan will actually be the 100th event. Uh, the company is established in 2004. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about the upcoming conference. Um, the Unlockers, Unlocking Solar Capital Africa event is part of a series of Unlocking Solar Capital events that uh, are taking place in Asia, Africa uh, and in Latin America. Um, in Africa, it's uh, the second edition, and uh, as said, it will take place at the 25th and 26th of October. We expect over 350 decision makers to gather and engage in extensive discussions to solve Africa's solar energy funding gap and get projects realized. Um, during the conference, so we will have some in-depth discussions over separate tracks. Uh, we will focus both on on-grid, off-grid and mini-grid. Um, and we will go in-depth about solar financing and development. We will have matchmaking uh, sessions uh, and interactive networking break. Um, and of course, we are uh, placed in Abidjan. I'm very happy to announce uh, our organizing partners. We co-organize this event with Gogla. Uh, and furthermore, Power Africa and Poparco are joining us as organizing partners. Uh, we have CDC, our diamond sponsor, and some gold sponsors as well. Uh, this is a selection of uh, organizations that participated last year, and we are waiting some extra organizations to join this year as well. Um, I would like to continue with some practical notes. Do you have any questions for our speakers? Please, please uh, submit them through the GoToWebinars chat box on the right side of your screen. Uh, and you can use uh, the chat box as well for technical issues. The presentation slides will be available after this uh, webinar, so you can always look it back. I will start with an introduction uh, of our speakers. The first speaker of today is Usainu Nakulima. He's the Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency of the African Development Bank Group. He has more than 15 years of experience in energy climate change international banking and finance sector development. And he was the former director of the Green Climate Fund in Korea with global responsibility for partnerships, country strategies and project preparations. So we will now start with his presentation.
Hello, Usainu, are you in? Yes, Lija, good afternoon. So, please, uh, Usainu, you can start your presentation now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lija, for this invitation and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and to talk about this very exciting subject. Uh, what I would like to do in this very short presentation is to share our ambition uh, at the African Development Bank uh, for energy access in Africa and also link it to this uh, solar potential that we, uh, we are talking about today. But more substantially, what I would like to do is to uh, talk about the barriers that we see in terms of unlocking this potential and how uh, we are trying to address it through a certain number of initiatives. So let me start uh, uh, very quickly first by uh, telling you about this ambition. And it's very simple. We have launched what we call the New Deal uh, for Energy in Africa. And uh, the New Deal aspires to achieve universal access by 2025. Uh, what I would like to draw your attention on on this graph is the different curves as you have to see, starting with the bottom one. The bottom one shows you uh, from 2015 to 2030 uh, what we can expect in terms of evolution of access to electricity uh, in different scenarios. So from the bottom, with business as usual, we will just uh, reach 45% access by 2025. So if you go up to the uh, top curve, which is the one the New Deal on Energy uh, for Africa is aspiring to achieve, you can see that it's a, it's a huge jump. So two messages here. Uh, the first message is that uh, this, this jump cannot be achieved uh, without uh, doing a certain, a certain number of uh, key uh, initiatives and, and key changes in the, the way we are operating. Uh, the second message is that actually this is already happening. If we take this solar potential, uh, two elements of innovation regarding solar generated uh, power. One is that uh, projects, solar projects take much shorter time to be implemented compared to what uh, traditionally we experience in terms of uh, development of uh, power projects, especially fuel, uh, fuel generated uh, power. And the second element is that the technology risk is much uh, lower. So uh, this can already give us a kind of uh, uh, head start in terms of going from the bottom of this curve, this graph to the, uh, to the top. However, what I would like to highlight, and that's my second message, is that even with the technology and the falling prices of solar and the fact that this, uh, these projects are easier to implement, uh, this ambition will not happen by itself. And we need a certain number of additional elements that I will lay out in the rest of this presentation. But first of all, let's translate into concrete figures what we mean by achieving universal access by 2025. So we try to cut the numbers at the African Development Bank and these four different boxes give you in a nutshell what we mean. Uh, so it's first about uh, setting up 160 gigawatt of new capacity. Uh, second, uh, not only putting generation but also connecting households. So we think that we have to create 130 million uh, new connections for households by uh, on-grid solutions in the next seven, seven to eight years. But on-grid solutions will not uh, be sufficient. We also need to harness the off-grid uh, capacity, the off-grid potential. And for that, our objective is to facilitate 75 million new connections through off-grid solutions. And last but not least, uh, a subject that is often forgotten, which is access to clean uh, cooking energy. And we also have estimated that we need to provide these kind of solutions to 150 million households. So what do we need to do in order to make this happen? 
uh, we've looked at our past experience and uh, a certain number of uh, initiatives are underway uh, and I can I can put them in two buckets. The first two bullet points are about uh, enabling environment and the second, uh, the, the, the third and the fourth one are about scaling up investment. So the first two uh, regarding the enabling environment and removing barriers are first of all providing funding for project preparation. So at the, at the bank we have a fund that is dedicated to this kind of activity which is the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa. Uh, and secondly, we are also developing some uh, advisory services to governments for IPP procurement processes that can put more efficiency in the project development cycle, especially at the, in the early stages. So this is to remove barriers. But we need also to scale up investment. And one way to do it is to provide uh, funding that is uh, competitive uh, for these kind of projects. So leveraging climate funds uh, like the, the Green Climate Fund or the CTF to provide blended finance uh, could unlock actually the barriers that uh, private sponsors see in terms of cost of funding. And last but not least, uh, we've talked about the we on-grid solutions, on-grid IPPs, but more and more we see the potential for uh, achieving universal access through what we call the mini grid, in particular to enable the nexus between energy, water, and agriculture in rural areas. Uh, more than half of the population in Africa live in rural areas, so we cannot achieve universal access without thinking about solutions outside of, of the grid. Let me now uh, talk about more specifically three different initiatives that we are launching at the bank uh, to address the issues and the barriers that we are hearing from, from the market. So I, I talked about the off-grid uh, potential. So we organized a few months ago, at the end of March, a workshop with about 150 participants representing service companies, governments, and different financials to understand what the potential of this uh, industry is and what uh, what are the issues that actors are facing. Uh, more particularly, uh, uh, issues related to access to finance, uh, risk perception, but also uh, the different business models, which one are successful, which one are prone to fail. So out of this workshop, we have now, uh, we are in the process of developing comprehensive support packages both for countries and for companies, for countries to help them procure the right partners and for companies to access working capital uh, and uh, other type of financial instrument they need. We have in particular seen that local currency financing is an issue, but also uh, securitization of receivables uh, for, for these players. So uh, the off-grid revolution is underway. That's what uh, today we have seen and we want to foster it and facilitate. Uh, second important initiative, we have seen that when you talk about solar, uh, well, it's no longer the 200 and the 300 megawatt uh, development finance institutions have been uh, accustomed to uh, for, for the past decades. Now we are talking more and more about small projects. Apologies because this slide is a bit crowded, but I want to just uh, throw your attention to three elements. One is the fact that this is about the creation of a facility for energy inclusion dedicated to small scale uh, projects. Second point, this would be this will be a debt fund, not a private equity fund. And third element, we have divided it in two windows. So the idea is to raise $500 million. Uh, the bank has already committed $100 million, And there will be two windows, one dedicated to off-grid projects, about 20% of this amount, and another one for on-grid. So we, what we hope to achieve for this facility is to address the issue of uh, our processes as a development financial institutions not, uh, not adapted to small projects. And uh, sponsors will tell you that 
they are often frustrated when they present to the World Bank, the African Union Bank, and other DFI projects that need 20, 30 million, and that it takes uh, a long time to, to process. So we, we hope that by having a dedicated instrument with a dedicated fund manager, we can address this issue. Now, the last uh, uh, initiative that we are working on is actually to be able to support SMEs in this sector, because that's also uh, a new trend. Uh, formerly, when you talked about uh, projects in the energy sector, you were thinking about large-scale utilities, but more and more, actually, you, you will find small and medium-sized enterprises. Even some project developers can qualify as small and medium-sized enterprises. So the way we can support them would be, in addition to the different points I earlier mentioned, would be through local financial institutions. And that will be my last point, and I think one of the most important in my presentation. Uh, we cannot achieve uh, the scale, we cannot uh, remove barriers at country level if we don't leverage local financial institutions. Because at the end of the day, well, even if you talk about the uh, perception of the risk, well, local financial institutions have a better perception of, of the risk than international financial institutions. So the bank will try to provide financing to local financial institutions and also uh, technical assistance, capacity building, because we believe that they are an important part of the architecture and uh, an important part of the solution to unlocking the, the solar capital. So I will stop here and uh, uh, stand ready to answer uh, any question. I also look forward to hearing the, uh, the because this is the, the view from the bank, but the most important view is from the practitioner, the project developers, the investors. So looking forward to hearing also the views from Charlotte. Thank you, Lija. Thank you, Seinuna Kulima, for this wonderful presentation. So uh, if there are any questions that you would like to see uh, Usainu Nakalima answering, uh, feel free to submit them through the chat box on the right side of the GoToWebinar tool. Uh, then we will continue with our next speaker. Um, yeah. Our next speaker is Charlotte Obe Kalajan, and she is the founder and CEO of Greenwish Partners. She has over 20 years of experience in environmental and infrastructural investment and asset management, and she is truly a pioneer of renewable energy development and investment in sub saharan Africa. Welcome, Charlotte. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Usain. Hello. That's Hi, great. everyone. Uh, <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah. Well, first, thank you, Senu, because you are the solution to all our challenges, and I look forward to working with you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just uh, one quick word about Greenwish. So, we are a uh, renewable energy producer dedicated to uh, the African continent uh, with, um, uh, you know, four different business lines and uh, a little bit in line with what Senu was sharing is uh, our view is uh, that renewable can bring a lot of uh, value and, and be a key solution for the uh, powering of Africa, uh, but it cannot go only on the grid. Um, so we have four business uh, lines which are the on-grid solar IPP project that are project finance, as we did in Senegal, uh, and we can we'll spend a few minutes on it. We also develop solution uh, for the captive power, both for the industrial sector as well as the CNI and telecom sector. Uh, we believe that you know with the competitiveness now of solar and battery solution, uh, renewable can fast track. Uh, the development of power solution, um, remote, of grid, and also on a portfolio basis. Um, the last uh, business line that we have is uh, for the 
last night. So we are developing a solution, a bundled solution for the unconnected people that uh, makes a solution of power uh, and distribution of solar home system, as well as an access to uh, uh, data and digitalization, uh, with the view that we will fast track multiple segments um, in in a mutualized distribution network for the different challenges of the last mile. Now, if we start with the uh, our first project and our you know core initial uh, business line. Uh, that is on grid. So we have connected uh, last year in uh, record time uh, a project in Senegal uh, um, that we developed within 12 months. Uh, there was previous uh, development uh, and that we built in seven and a half months. Uh, but this, this was a, a great uh, achievement, but this is a very challenging, uh, uh, you know, achievement to replicate and and it was full of hurdle and I want to share a little bit about you know what are the challenges and uh, what we uh, you know what how we can go about it so in terms of the challenges sorry Lydia I confused you on the pages if you can go to the the page three yes so what we see is solar project, as Useno was mentioning, they are much easier from a technical perspective than conventional or hydro project. Uh, meanwhile, they imply you know, the same contracting level because it's all about capex. There's hardly any opex. We don't, we don't pay the sun, uh, but we, we, we have major investment up front. So we need the same type of very strong counterparty guarantee from the off-taker, be they private or, or, or public. Uh, and as we know, most of the African utility, because they need to subsidize the power, they are structurally in deficit, and that implies that we need support from government. Government that are also constrained on how much balance sheet they put, they can put, you know, in front of take up pay agreement or sovereign guarantee. So these these are some challenges. The second challenge, uh, 20 megawatt in Senegal, that was 26 million euro uh, investment. That is uh, very difficult to amortize all the cost of development and the cost of finance, uh, financial structuring, especially project finance, on such a small amount. Um, so that is, and the third point is the timing. You know, project finance takes a lot of time. It's very cumbersome. Um, you know, be it on the due diligence, uh, the environmental study, the technical study. Uh, they, they, the, you know, the project finance structure, our initial uh, experience was it is not adapted to solar project. It makes them too expensive, too slow. Um, and it's not adapted to the technology. That's why you, you know, we look and we are actively discussing with people like Usenu and, and other DFI about what could be the solution to fast track and unlock this potential on the on-grid sector. So on the on-grid sector, what we see is typically uh, how can we standardize some of the processing? How can we replicate you know, financial structure with one developer on his portfolio with similar EPC contract, with similar, you know, PPA to the extent it is possible, um, a similar financing structure. How can we standardize? Because if you remember in Europe, that's how we developed with commercial bank. They were financing small solar project, but they did it in portfolios. And that was, you know, the scalability. That's what created the scalability of the solar market. So here, in the context of Africa, where we need DFI because commercial banks don't have balance sheets to support 17 or 15 years loan, DFI needs to adapt to this fast track process. Meanwhile, keeping, you know, the the uh, the discipline you know of the project finance but enabling to accelerate another big challenge we see is you know the balance sheet of the utility the sovereign guarantee that we all 
to request to put in place project finance. Here, we would welcome very much that uh, the DFI, and I think there are some initiatives like that at AFDB and World Bank, but also uh, European Bank, that they create uh, some bundle PRG around regional portfolio to create you know, some diversification on their exposure for partial risk guarantee uh, without uh, you know, putting all the pressure on the dedicated state. Um, so these, these are some of the solutions uh, we've been looking at. Another element that I would like to put uh, on the table is the financing structure. So what we did, uh, the financing timing, there is uh, a financial instrument for any specific risk. What we have uh, um, ended up doing in Senegal is we have initially put together a construction finance that we are refinancing uh, uh, right now. And that enabled to you know, separate the risk profile between construction and operation. Meanwhile, adapting the right cost of capital to the right, um, uh, to the right risk. And this has been successful, and we hope to deliver it uh, for in, in other projects. Now, I would uh, talk quickly about some other uh, elements uh, to go again to, to you know, untap the solar potential, which is a lot of what we do in the captive power space. So we have decided to create a very large telecom energy service company with a target of powering 10,000 off-grid towers by 2020. This represents $800 million investment. And why we have decided to focus on this sector is there are 200,000 and soon 300,000 telecom towers that are reliant on diesel. So that means expensive power, unreliable power, volatility of you know, the pricing of the diesel, but also huge carbon footprint. Meanwhile, if you can convert with solar battery and outsource the power, you can create a lot of uh, technical, operational, environmental, and especially financial value for the uh, operator. So we have a, a sign of first operation in DRC and are converting a portfolio of uh, telecom tower. This is, I think, a very interesting way, and this can be replicated in many different sectors, you know, to use the clean energy uh, solution to unlock on a fast uh, movement uh, the, the powering challenges of the continent. And this implies, um, you know, different types of financing. We are not talking about project finance, we are more talking about asset finance, we are more talking about corporate financing or vendor financing. And so we are working on very innovating financing structure so that we can replicate and scale up a portfolio of solar battery solution for the telecom sector. So these are the, the key points uh, that, that I wanted to share and maybe open up uh, to, to the question and debate between Osinu and myself. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Charlotte. And uh, as you just mentioned, uh, people are free to uh, submit any questions through uh, the chat box um, on the right side of your screen. And uh, now we will continue with uh, a debate. Uh, I will invite Usenu as well. Hello, Usenu, are you in? Yes, Lydia, I'm in, I'm in. And I have, a, if you want, a first question for, for Charlotte. Okay, please uh, bring about that question. Okay, so Charlotte, thanks so much for, for this presentation. And also, I've taken good note of your, your suggestions. I will bring them back home to uh, better tailor our, our products for, for you and your, your peers. But one question I have is regarding the country risk and more particularly your recommendation regarding the PRGs. Um, as you've rightly said, uh, the capacity of governments to provide guarantees is, is limited by their own balance sheet. But uh, what I would like to know is, uh, on the flip side, you as a developer or as an investor, uh, to what extent would you be uh, ready to take uh, country risk? What is the limit 
for you to to take uh, uh, not only counter risk but also the risk on, of on your off takers without a sovereign guarantee. Or uh, another way to put the question is uh, to to what extent is a sovereign, sovereign guarantee needed for for investors to take the off take risk? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point to say, no. <laughs> and it's interesting because I'm going to send it back to you. <laughs> when you know, now that we have a portfolio in development in many countries, one of the first things we do before digging into uh, looking into a, an opportunity is a macro assessment, country assessment, bankability assessment of the country. And where do we go? We go and discuss with our banker partner and PRG and you know. Uh, insurance counterparty, so either you or the World Bank, uh, uh, you know, partner, uh, because our main constraint will be, am I going to be able to put debt on this project? So that is one of the first questions we ask ourselves. Is this country bankable? If, you know, I want to develop this project that makes sense for the country, that is uh, consistent from a technical standpoint, there is uh, capacity on the grid, I can be competitive on my tariff, but if I cannot structure a bankable PPA and contract, contract, a general contract, then I won't be able to finance it. So in fact, you know, us, we probably have much more risk appetite uh, than, of course, the lenders, and we would be able to go in many different types of country and we have appetite for risky country as you know I mentioned we are working in DRC uh, that is you know a challenging market but what we care about is we're going to be 25 30 percent of the financing structure are the rest of the financing partner be comfortable with the country so that's why you know I really think both DFI and IPPs like us need to work in, you know, in a cooperative mode uh, and look at solution, uh, you know, together with the government that is compatible with the uh, capacity, balance sheet capacity of the states, the risk appetite of uh, the debt provider, and giving a minimum of comfort for the right level, uh, for the right level of um, uh, of return and risk uh, that the developer are taking. So, Senu, I would like to thank you for opening up this debate and Charlotte for uh, answering. Um, now, um, you can see that we entered a short discussion and uh, I would like to uh, bring about the next statement. DFIs should play a key role in government coordination and in creating political commitment. Charlotte, can you please uh, give your opinion on, on that, followed by Usenu. Yes, definitely. Usenu, sorry, I, <laughs> I offload all the responsibility to you. But definitely, uh, I, I believe, and, and we've been advocating uh, quite a lot with DFI, especially those that have a double hat, like AFDB, where you both cover the public sector as well as the private sector, what uh, I really see the, you know, in terms of the value you can bring to uh, unlocking, you know, this market is support the government from a technical, from a capacity building, as you mentioned, technical, legal, uh, contracting, they, you know, this, we deal with a lot of government, with a lot of utility and many utility, they, first, they don't have the experience because solar is new. Uh, also, some countries don't have the IPP type of experience. They've been only uh, doing PPP type of project. Second, they don't know well their grid. So you can, they can waste time negotiating with developers on projects that will never happen because the grid cannot take the project. And then, you know, they, they struggle on signing PPA. And gosh, we review so many PPA that were non-bankable, too high tariff, uh, you know, not balance, and if, you know, the development banks are supporting the utilities and the government to negotiate the private sector, it goes so much faster. So one thing we often do is uh, when we start negotiating with the government when it's a bilateral project, 
what I ask is, do you have an international uh, legal advisor? Because there's no point for us starting a negotiation on a PPA if, you know, the public counterpart doesn't have the same uh, level of support. Um, and I often uh, recommend them uh, to be, for those who are not uh, working with them, uh, work with the legal facility of AFDB, which I think is, is an amazing tool um, so that, you know, everybody is equally equipped to negotiate and develop projects uh, that can come to fruition. Yes. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Usainu, can you uh, reply on uh, uh, Charlotte's statement? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Actually, Charlotte has said it uh, all in terms of uh, what, what kind of role we can, we can play in this, in this area. Uh, the only thing I would add is about the, the challenges we are facing as we, as we try to, to bring this, this value. Um, let's say two things. One is uh, co coordination. Uh, between DFIs, actually, because in a single country you may have different DFIs active and uh, in, with, a, with an ongoing relationship with the government, with an ongoing conversation. So I think one effort we have to, to, to make is to have uh, more coordination, more complementarity between, uh, between DFIs as they work in a country. And I would say that that's also a little bit the role of the government to ensure such coordination and to, uh, to, to assign different DFIs to different uh, areas of support and ensuring the, the coordination. So this is uh, the, the first uh, element in terms of hurdle. The second element, which also is quite, quite uh, dear to my heart, is to ensure that uh, whatever support we are providing to government, be it advisory services or technical assistance, is something that is transformative and sustainable. So uh, not only sending uh, a team of consultants or a team to support the government in a transaction, but actually uh, creating or uh, building the capacity of institutions who can do it sustainably, who can do not only the first solar project, the first synergy, but a series of them. Uh, and I, I feel that this requires not only time, but also for us to think creatively about uh, how to uh, body build the local institutions uh, at the government level so that they can be sustainably the, the, the counterparts that, uh, that Charlotte is looking for. Thank you, uh, Usainu. Uh, now I would li like to take you to a next statement. The next statement is, it is the responsibility of DFIs to advocate for equal tax and subsidy treatment across technologies. Charlotte, would you like to open again? Uh, you know, it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that, this subject is very interesting and this is another one where we, we uh, we are active in advocacy. I mean, because the continent is so short of power in, in most of the countries, there is a high reliance on diesel. And of course, um, you know, so that uh, power remains affordable, meanwhile still very expensive, a lot of countries have, you know, to support and reduce the price of, uh, of, of diesel. So in different manner, either there's no tax or there is fuel subsidy, um, but the outcome of this, uh, and, and meanwhile, I should say, on the renewable side, meanwhile, in Europe, when we started in the renewable sector, I remember my first transaction was a solar project at 60 cents euro in France, rooftop. <laughs> uh, we needed subsidy to create this market, but now, you know, solar doesn't need any support, doesn't need any subsidy. Um, the technology is very competitive and prices are, dec are declining uh, uh, increasingly. But if you treat differently, you know, the tax uh, aspect, of the, the tax between renewable technology, and I think one that is still very challenging is battery. 
battery is still expensive and will go down, but import duty in many countries are still very high. Like in Guinea, I think it's about 28%, uh, if not more. In Nigeria, we're talking about 30% import duty. Meanwhile, you have diesel that is at 0 0.5 cents uh, dollar the liter. Um, that is very low and that is needed to support people uh, being able to use power. So one thing we very much advocate is, you know, move towards an equal treatment and equal, equal, uh, equal incentive for the different technology. Because in country where fuel is at 0 0.5 dollar the liter, it's very difficult to create uh, um, economies with solar battery, which is blocking the development of the sector. In the country where it's at one dollar, one point one dollar, gosh, on telecom we can save you know uh, thirty percent of the total cost of power. There is huge value creation, uh, but it's very much linked to the policy and harmony uh, in the different technology. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Usainu, the stage okay. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Charlotte, I think this is a hot potato, right? Um, but, well, I, 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 would, I would try to, I would tend to disagree, slightly disagree with you in terms of whether it's a responsibility of DFIs or not. I, I hear you in terms of how DFIs can actually uh, play a role in this. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's sometimes such a sensitive issue with so many different implications in terms of uh, social safety net. Uh, but for, for instance, in countries where uh, these kind of subsidies are going to uh, going for the uh, energy inclusion of, of population that are in rural areas or that. Uh, are underserved, or uh, in other countries, it can be just uh, a political decision. So, to what extent DFIs have a leverage in their conversation with the government to address this particular issue, or to to uh, to ask uh, for technology neutrality in terms of subsidy, uh, is is sometimes a little bit tricky. I would give you two examples where actually the conversation has started, but. Uh, maybe not coming from DFIs, but coming from, from the government. One is Zambia, where traditionally uh, the cost of energy was not, uh, the tariff of energy was not cost reflective, especially for mining companies. Another example is Algeria, uh, where also the government has been for many, many years subsidizing heavily uh, uh, fossil fuel for, 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 for social reasons. And, and in these two countries, actually, uh, reforms are underway. And in Nigeria, most recently, the, the new government has indicated clearly that this would be the path. But mm. it came from the government. Uh, and last point, uh, I, I would tend to agree with you, uh, Charlotte, and uh, no bias, I'm, I'm uh, responsible for renewable energy. So I would really want to, to, to have at government level the right decisions to foster the development of new energy. But uh, I think one way to do that would be also to uh, broaden the scope of this discussion beyond government and DFIs, but put it in the context of the Paris Agreement, for instance. Governments have uh, taken some commitments under the Paris Agreement through their nationally determined contributions. And one way for them to achieve their, their, their commit to realize their commitments uh, would be to actually remove some of these uh, subsidies that go to fossil fuel and naturally freeing some fiscal space for, for the development of cleaner energy, thereby uh, achieving their objectives. So that could be one way also to address this, this issue. Thank you. Yeah. And Usenu, if I may complain, in fact, you know, I didn't think that uh, DFI has this responsibility. I think you have a dialogue that can facilitate. But to be clear, you know, we, we presented some paper to some government to, uh, you know, with concrete uh, figures to, to 
bring the awareness of the challenge. And I'm uh, totally not advocating for cutting the subsidy. I don't think this is the right way, as you said, because of social inclusion, even for industrial. The big challenge is the competitiveness of industry. You can't grow the industry of the continent if you don't have a competitive power. My, my view is, is different, is what can you do to make renewable be uh, cost reflective, you know, and grow in the mix of the country? Because if you support, look at solar, if you support solar that is only capex, once it's installed, then you have 25 years of operation that is very cheap. And so progressively, you know, when you integrate renewable into the energy mix of a country, you reduce the import of diesel, you reduce the uh, subsidy level, and you create, you go towards the uh, economic balance. So my view is, is really not on cutting anything, especially when it's needed for social inclusion and industrial competitiveness, but more building, and I like your idea of the Paris Agreement, which I hope we'll get involved into, is growing, you know, a support system to enable the renewable to go faster into the market without this bias of, you know, tax of subsidy. Mm. Thank, Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Usain, would you like to comment on that? No, I think it's a it, it's a very it's a very valid point, and, and I think it was a very good uh, conclusion to this, this discussion. Okay, then we will continue with some Q and A time, uh, as there have been uh, some questions coming in. Uh, I would like to start with a question for Usainu. Uh, Usainu, could you please elaborate on how you would bring local lenders into the $500 million funds you are in the process of setting up? In the most instances we find, or the person who is bringing about this question, finds that the commercial banks cannot provide the tenors that electricity projects need to make them viable. Would the AFDB be providing products like tenor extension facilities and technical assistance facilities? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And actually, it's a spot on in terms of uh, what, um, what uh, kind of... Uh, kind of barrier. Uh, what, what, kind of, what, kind of what kind of barrier the uh, commercial banks are facing and what kind of instruments we can uh, provide to them. Yes, uh, when I talk to uh, sponsors and even when I talk to commercial banks, and I met two of them last week uh, for, in Zambia, well, actually, what they're telling me as uh, as, as as constraints are twofold. One is the uh, cost of funding uh, at the local level, and two is a tenure. So we are thinking at the bank, we are working actually on uh, financial instruments to address these two issues. Uh, one is blended finance, so leveraging climate funds, which are cheaper in terms of interest rate with our own uh, funding to lower the uh, the cost of funding for private developers. And second is, yes, extension of tenure by providing, for instance, a financing guarantee that could allow commercial banks to extend their, the maturity of their, their loans from uh, five years, as one of the commercial banks I talked to told me, to uh, say 10 years. And this can allow uh, project uh, companies to uh, be uh, e more easily compliant with the debt service coverage ratios that uh, are imposed to them. So this is uh, the question. Oh. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Usainu. Uh, then I would like to continue with a question for Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, um, can you answer how did you raise finance to fund uh, to fund the development phase of the projects you are describing uh, in your last presentation. Yeah, so for Synergy, um, uh -huh, interesting. Um, that was uh, also a bit of a record because we, we didn't put uh, a lot of development uh, budget at risk. Uh, and that was uh, a beginning with uh, my partner, Jean. And um, 
we put yeah very little uh, not even half a million at risk on the development of this project um, until we entered the, the major you know financial structuring phase uh, but the way we we funded it so this one was very much uh, personal funding from the shareholders you know of the, the capital of the company um, and then we raised uh, we raised the first vehicle and that was uh, 20 million dollar it was our first capital raise that then was uh, followed by 250 million dollar from Denham capital and in this first vehicle we uh, focused on uh, investors that were both uh, European but especially African including the Caisse des Depots of Senegal um, and you know they once we entered the financial structuring phase the development was supported by our vehicle but what we try to do always Lydia is avoid being in the trap of three years four years five years development spending that is external cost but also internal cost you spend a lot of uh, time of low people resources and and then you know the challenge is that you know, people get uh, too much exposed we get too much exposed on on development um, we uh, also need to factor in this development cost as well as the development premium into the pricing uh, of you know the into the tariff that we propose and of course the longer the project the more expensive and the more expensive would be the tariff we propose so we always look for the quick win and how we how and where we can go fast often it's uh, looking at what is you know uh, the commitment from the off taker so political co the commitment if uh, these are the uh, government private are they looking and are we really creating a solution because if you create uh, savings and reliability improvement for an industrial or a telecom player for sure it's going to be faster to uh, to grow and um, so we are very cautious about how much and how long we spend on, on development uh, in our business. Hmm. Thank you, Charlotte, for answering this question. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, have another question and uh, please keep the answers a bit short so uh, we can have multiple questions before we have to end this webinar. Um, I would like to ask a question about the CNI sector. Uh, do you have any scheme to lower the risk for the foreign loan providers to the solar projects in Africa, especially for the CNI sector? Hmm. Okay, uh, we have we have a number of um, we have a number of, uh, of of products, guaranteed products that we are providing to um, uh, to cover the risk of. Uh, uh, different uh, uh, providers of finance. So we have the partial risk guarantee that cover the, the risk from the government point of view, the partial credit guarantee from the uh, the, the credit risk uh, point of view. Um, the, the, the one thing that we are still struggling uh, and that we on and we think challenging is uh, to uh, to provide uh, uh, to provide a guarantee products for the risk of devaluation. Uh, many developers will tell you that uh, access to local currency financing uh, would be a game changer. But I must admit that even though there are some solutions out there, uh, it's not easy uh, to find uh, an affordable one. So yeah, that would be, uh, let's say, the, the, the one thing that we still need to work on uh, as, a, as a whole, as, a, as an industry, as an ecosystem. Thank you, uh, Usenu. Uh, then the next question, can corporate PPAs be an alternative mitigation route to country risk? Who would like to answer this question? I can Thank say a much. word on it. Hmm. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know who asked this question, but that was a theme I wanted to raise. You know, one of the uh, uh, 
uh, one of the solution uh, we're looking to uh, unleash the burden of uh, PPA um, and sovereign guarantee for governments is private sector PPA. And I think there are two ways to look at it. Either the uh, totally off-grid uh, type of industrial that are not on the grid and can get some benefit by including renewable on their energy mix, or the other uh, situation situation is the big off-taker uh, that are connected to the grid um, that uh, are of course the biggest payer you know to the uh, to the grid um, but that can also be part of the solution so one of the things we look at in some countries is when they are a big corporate off-taker we look at the opportunity to do willpower still you know so it means shifting the take or pay and the sovereign guarantee to maybe a, a parent company guarantee of a corporate. Meanwhile, preserving the margin of the utility by paying them a tuning fee to use their grid. The virtue I see in this model is that we preserve the margin of the uh, utility. We free up some of their balance sheet exposure, same for the government, uh, so that they can invest in transportation, in distribution, and you know get exposure on other aspects of energy supply, and uh, and still have more capacity going into the grid, uh, you know, with an off taker that is directly a private off taker. I think that it 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 requires quite a a, a lot of uh, adjustment on regulation for many countries. Morocco is already structured uh, like that. Uh, but this is definitely something that can bring a lot of value to the uh, unlocking uh, of power in Africa. Yes, totally agree. Uh, I, I, you know, when I was talking about, and that's a question I asked uh, Charlotte, to what extent we can do without sovereign guarantee, I do think uh, that is one solution, is to actually build or to find credible of takers, uh, credible in terms of credit risk. And, and I think that's also one of the roles of BFIs, beyond just providing project financing, is to build institutions. And when I say build institutions, I mean also build credible of takers. Okay, um, the next question uh, is one for SMEs. Which are, according to you, the best African countries for on-grid projects and why? Usainu, would you like to answer that question? Well, that's a very difficult question for us, uh, African Development Bank. You know, we are working with 54 uh, countries in Africa, so we are trying to provide each of them uh, access to, to energy and finding tailored solution. I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I can't really uh, direct investors to one country or another. Um, yeah, I, I think I would pass on this one, but what I would just maybe recommend is uh, to, uh, whenever you go in a country, is to really make a full assessment uh, of the, the market and uh, you can put whatever safeguard that you want. Uh, at the end of the day, the key question is, does the project make sense? Does the sector, does an investment in this sector make sense from the economic point of view? And I think the, the, then the safeguards, the guarantees, et cetera, are just an add on. Uh, but uh, the fundamental question first is whether, whether the, the economics are good. Thank you. Uh, Charlotte, would you like to give your opinion as well? To be honest, I don't have much to say on this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, people asking questions about specific countries. Uh, for example, what investment returns are investors seeking for in PV projects in Senegal? Wow. Is any of you able to comment on that? Well, yeah, no, I'm not sure I can really answer. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so this, it, it really depends on, you know, the risk profile and, and at which point the, uh, the project uh, in terms of early stage development or 
um, late stage development. Uh, to be honest, uh, on our, already on our project, we have uh, that is connected, that is cash flow generating. Uh, we already had some, some requests to buy this project. So my, my view is there's so much capital available, both on the debt side and the equity side, and so few projects that reach financial close and connect, a connection. Uh, that uh, the, there would be sooner a strong pressure on, you know, the, uh, the, the, the return. Okay, then uh, I would like to go over the last question. Uh, someone is asking, what is Charlotte's opinion on financeability of utility scale solar in Ghana? Ah. Interesting, and uh, to be honest, that's a, a country where we haven't been very active. Uh, the reason, uh, not that we don't like Ghana, but exactly uh, we were very reluctant on the, the structure that was in place in terms of bankability of uh, the project, but also the number of projects that were uh, you know, going in, develop, getting developed into Ghana. So uh, this has been addressed, and it seems that now there is a potential bankability. You know, from um, the the contracting structure, contracting package that uh, Ghana is offering. I think there's also a general restructuring of the country that is very interesting. But if we were to go to Ghana, uh, we would be more comfortable with industrial. Um, that have huge deficits and a lot of uh, very bankable, uh, you know, corporate of taker. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. And then I would like to wrap up with a Q&A time. Um, in the meantime, you have seen my contact details. Uh, you can, of course, always be in touch with me to uh, talk about the upcoming conference in Abidjan. Uh, and we also have a conference website, africa.unlockingsolarcapital.com. So, and uh, these are our upcoming events. Uh, we will have an Unlocker Solar Capital Asia as well, the 28th and 29th of September, uh, that will be hosted in Singapore. Then, of course, our event in Abidjan, followed by Making Solar Bankable, that will take place in Amsterdam on the 15th and 16th uh, of February. Uh, we have a wonderful venue there, so I hope a lot of people will join us uh, in Amsterdam. So, uh, it was a real pleasure uh, that uh, all of you were listening and joining us today for this webinar. And I would like to thank again uh, Charlotte Ober Kalajan and Usainu Nakulima uh, for taking time in your very busy schedules to uh, speak to us today. <laughs> and um, thank you. I wish everyone uh, a good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>